poner este pones aquí o como no es? Bueno, Aracha León, Gusti hoy, eh, Ongi Torri. Good afternoon and welcome to this latest uh, Gutun Surya session. And this session is entitled Ghosts in the Book, Thinking Translation. Thanks to all of you for coming, and especially to Mariano Chua de Arribe, Javier Calvo, and Coro Navarro for having accepted our invitation. They're all great translators. And um, it's not actually easy to hear a translator speak, because they're usually out of focus. So it's actually great to have them here with us. I earlier said that the title of today's talk is Ghosts in a Book, uh, Thinking Tran Translation. This is a book that was published by Javier in 2016, and it talks about translation. Um, says some very interesting things, and this is going to be like a starting point for today's um, conversation this year. Translation is a leitmotif of this event. And of course, today we're going to be talking about literary translation within this large world of translation, which is a part of the world of translation. So I think it's a unique opportunity to be able to have translators uh, talking to each other. And I'm not going to talk for much longer. Because with this introduction, there's uh, uh, quite a few people that want to talk. We don't have much time, so I'm going to introduce you to the three uh, speakers. Just a language note. I'm going to introduce them in Basque, but we'll be holding this talk in Spanish. And then when the public takes the floor, you can uh, use which either of the two languages you prefer, Basque or Spanish on my left. I've got Coronavarro. Coro's one of the major names of translation, literary translation into Basque. She was a lecturer at the uh, uh, Martutene Translator School. And she's translated many, many authors into Basque, uh, mainly from English. I think she started out uh, translating 1989 with Patricia. Hi, Smith, but she's spoken. Ed, she's also translated Ed Garland Poe, Doris Lessing, Isaac Bishop is singer, and a whole series of other very well-known authors. And her most recent work is The Sun Also Rises by Hemingway, which published in 2020. So she's a translator that's received many, many prizes, including the Euskadi Translation Prize. So it's great to have her with us. Next to her, we've got Mariana Ochoa de Orribe. She's from Bilbao, so she's home. She's got a PhD in comparative literature as a writer and translator. And thanks to her work, we can see And some people do say that about uh, translation. A translation allows you to see more of the world in many senses. She translates from uh, Romanian. And she also translates uh, the other way around, into Romanian. She's uh, translated Panet Instrati, Mircea Kartaescu. And Tatiana Tibolek, she's actually worked together with Mirkea Kartorescu, and she's, uh, it's great to have her here. They've worked together, Mirkea and um, Maria. And finally, Javier Calvo, who's a translator and also a novel writer. He's written many, many novels and has received several prizes. For example, the short story prize, like Goro, he normally translates from English into Spanish in this case, and he's 
uh, translated Foster Wallace, Curtsy, Don DeLillo, Joan Didion and Salman Rushdie and a whole long list of etc with some very contemporary authors and also some more classic authors so he's uh, got a long tradition in translation and he's written a very interesting book called A Ghost in the Book and that's about translation in fact, not very much is actually thought, uh, written about translation, so now you've got something to get your teeth into. So without further ado, I'm going to now speak in Spanish. So this first thing I wanted to propose to you, and the first question I wanted to ask you is, how did you get to where you are now? As I said earlier, literary translation isn't a very mainstream uh, job it's pretty vocational really to a large extent so i wanted to ask why each um, probably you've got different reasons why why are you translating literature that's my first question coro maybe you can start hello good afternoon thank you so much for having invited me here to the ascuna centro it's great to be here And thanks to all of the audience for having decided to come here and share this time with us. I'm going to speak in Spanish but first going in getting into detail. I wanted to say something, which is, I was saying it to my colleagues if they thought it was a good idea, and they said, yes, it's a good idea, which is that I think it's a little bit strange for me to be here. Well, maybe I think it's a little bit uh, strange for me to be talking here about such specific and unimportant issues such as translation and literature, when there's a war out there, very nearby. So I thought maybe the best way of recognizing that is saying, well, let's carry on doing our work as best we can and don't let that war prevent us from carrying on doing what we want to do to reflect now about translation. That's all I wanted to say at the outset. Now I'm going to reply to your question, which is how, I, how we started out in the world of literary translation. Was it vocational? I ought to say that when I was invited here I initially thought that I wasn't going to come because I'm retired, I do the odd thing, I do some translations, but very small things. And I'm happily living without any kind of obligations, it's great. But then people said to me at home, hey, hang on a minute, you know, you need to go. Yes, you do need to go. So I thought, okay, well, I better get my act together then. And now I'm really happy to be here because I've met Benyat Personally, I only had heard about him before. And also because I've met Marianne. I said that to her. I'm very enthusiastic about Romania and I'm really, really pleased and thankful to her because this is a, a very unknown uh, country and I think very underrated and I think she's making it known. So it's really good to be able to be here with her and I've asked her to relate to greetings to a colleague of hers who actually doesn't know me but I've worked translating as well and with Javier Calvo I'm also happy to be with him because as a result of this event I have found out via Benyat that he's written this book and published this book about translation and so I brought it to uh, here today as well because it's a great book and I recommend anybody to anybody that's interested in translation he talks about translation into Spanish translation in general and translation in Spanish but 99% of what he says is applicable or is of interest for Basque it might not be directly applicable but you can at least um, compare different cases it's very easy to read and excellent to get a bit of inspiration once I decided to come and attend this session. I reread a, a book that I read when I hadn't actually uh, started translation, but I was at the translator's uh, school in Martutene. 
I thought that I was never going to translate, and then all of a sudden I didn't hear about anything but translation. And a book was published called The Crime of Translation, the Lito de Traducir, who was a translator and a lecturer at Leon University, Julio Cesar Santoyo, and I read it. And I have this fantastic uh, memory of how much I laughed with this book. He spoke about how translators are traitors, thieves, and a complete uh, disaster because they all do their job really badly. So he gives example of uh, examples classified by different genres, etc., and also by using other criteria. Those that translate less than uh, the word, for example, he gives the figures about uh, books, for example, that in the original version has 200 pages and the Spanish version 127 pages in the Spanish version. And, and then the example of Moratin, Moratin, who's a really good translation, but who adds pages to uh, Hamlet and it says Shakespeare's not great. And that he's actually resisted the temptation to improve Hamlet. This other book, this the crime of uh, translation, it follows that tack. It refers to all kinds of translation, and you read it and you think, how have we survived? For example, how to the, the instructions for assembling a coffee pot. The translation is incredible. You actually, if you follow those instructions, you would never be able to assemble your coffee pot. Lists of film titles, another complete act of madness. Uh, films. Uh, with the titles of which uh, are just names, some just Dumbo, Mary Poppins, etc. All that's all that's there. All of the rest, which are called Elizabeth or whatever, have now uh, been translated terribly into something completely different. So uh, I read it again, and I got cross because it is funny. Yes, okay, it is funny what he says, and he says that the working conditions of translators aren't the best. But it doesn't say anything more than that. So when I read it for the first time and I laughed so much, I wasn't translating. And now I've spent many, many years translating. I've translated many, many pages. I think it's unfair and a bad, a bad read. Of course it's true there are bad translations out there, but you explain quite well in your book in what sort of context you're talking about, why they're so bad. So. So now that you've brought this subject at, maybe you want to say a little bit more about the role of, uh, of translators and this issue of um, mistakes and the fame, the reputation that they have. The book was born out of a bit of nostalgia and the terrible mistakes committed in translation. I think nowadays, you can pick up a translated book and you can have far greater guarantees that the book actually has followed a series of strategies and it's faithful to the original. But there was this romantic conception behind uh, the book in which the, the writer says, okay, you know, they're doing a great job. They're actually uh, translating the book, but actually in the past they're just doing what they fancy. They're writing an old thing. So it's not an ideal, and it's not an ideal that we want to go back to, but there's this sort of a no romantic nostalgia attached to that era. I don't know how to explain it, but my book uh, is based on this idea uh, that literality is almost like infidelity. Literalism is like infidelity. The fact that books are being translated so literally and uh, having reduced translators' freedom or curtailed translators' freedom, we're actually changing what originally literary translation was. I've never... I'm just a bit frightened now. I've never spoken... What about the... I, I, I've experienced... Uh, these lights, but there's there's people here in the audience. I'm a bit frightened. What about you, Maria? I don't know. H how do you deal with? Well, Javier spoke about translations that are more creative, 
uh, which you said uh, decades back was more common, and now more uh, literal translation models. Yes. I think we've gone from this uh, tend to recreate text and invent things, and everybody thought they could actually improve uh, as they uh, felt uh, the uh, text to a more recent fashion of uh, uh, not literally translating, but actually respecting the text that you're dealing with. And I think it's actually true. I work a little bit along this line, this very tense line. I don't recreate. I'm pretty f accurate and faithful to the text. But there are actually things that you have to recreate because you're not translating word by word. A word exists in a context. It's, it goes beyond the sentence that it appears in. So this, tench, this tension, my colleagues actually know about that, those that here, is kind of addictive. It makes this pressure, this uh, stress. It actually, I get this sort of, uh, sort of adrenaline rush, which makes me very happy. It's this sort of a pressure between the text that exists, the text that I uh, need to produce, and the translator that's between the two. What about genre? Some people say, I've heard said, that translating poetry, I don't know if any of you have actually translated poetry. I've been told that greater freedom is given in, when translating poetry. You can be more creative. I've just actually translated a poetry book from Catarescu, but Catarescu is a very special writer because his work in prose is actually even more poetic than his uh, than poems. In Catarescu you'll find that in 800 pages of the work and he says, oh, you're going to get involved in Catarescu's uh, poems. No, I, actually, he started out as a poet, and he says that he still is a poet, but he wrote, writes prose, and he says that now. So for me, personally, when I face uh, Catarescu's work, the most important thing is working on a sentence, because he says uh, that he writes every sentence as if it was the last sentence he was ever going to write. He writes in hand, so that gives his work a certain amount of a, a, di a different kind of rhythm. So if he writes longhand, and if that gives a certain rhythm to the way he builds text, the way he expresses, I sometimes see what is what I've worked in a day. And, and I can tell uh, how far he's got, because I can see, oh, by the end of the day, he's here. It's almost an organic way of writing. I don't have to explain it to you. It's almost like he's, uh, I'm just, being uh, delirious, but it's a kind of trance. You can see it's it's not very easy to explain, but it's there. So I always base what I do uh, on his rhythm, because I translate from a Romance language to another Romance language, between two Romance languages, so I play with the similarities, the obvious similarity between both languages. If you go to Romania a few days later, you start recognizing words, it's true that there's also Turkish and Slav, Slavic roots to Romanian, but it's a Romance language, it's easy to recognize. And so, as I uh, try to stick to this rhythm, I think it's easier to um, keep this uh, rhythm. That's because Romanian prosody is closer to, for example, English prosody. When you're comparing, uh, or from German, because for, if we're in a romance language, we're, it's like we're at home, as it were. Uh, language is, is in a, a language tree where you have more freedom. It's easier to be fluid, to actually follow the rhythm. It's easy to make uh, Catarescu's voice be heard in my translation. I want to say a couple of things. When you spoke about the nostalgia of those old translations, I'm a little bit nostalgic about that kind of literature. In my case, in the sense that I, when I was little, there was no children's literature. There were no children's or young people's books. In fact, in my case, there weren't many books at home. There were just a few. So I just read whatever I could get my hands on. 
And there were many uh, books about William Brown. They were my favorite, books about William Brown. I couldn't understand half of what was written. And they were written in Spanish. Of course, they were translation. I don't know how old I was. I'm not very old. But I really liked them. And I liked the fact that I didn't understand what was going on. I can remember there were these uh, stories by Madame de Lafayette, one called um, The Skylark. And I didn't even know what a Skylark was. It was called La Londra, The Skylark. But it added a certain something to the story because I didn't know what a Skylark was. It was this really wonderful feeling. And now that I'm a little old, uh, I picked up one of the uh, William Brown books and I find that there's a story in which they talk about Robin Hood, the translator, the translator who obviously isn't mentioned in the translation at all, puts a uh, footnote to the page and says, and says, in Spanish texts, Robin Hood to date, I don't know why. I don't know why, for goodness sake, or if he, I don't know if he writes for goodness sake, or he thinks it. But I don't know why. But they've always trans he's always been translated as Robin of the Forests, Robin de los Bosques. Nobody would write that now, or they would be a lot more refined if they did write it. It'd just be a refined translator's note. So there was a more freedom, and I'm not saying that it was better. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying it was better, but it was funny, Robin of the Forests. And the same thing happens to me, what this rhythm when you talk about. In the case of Basque, Basque doesn't have any uh, uh, prosodic affinities to Basque, nor with English. But I know that, I, that the music of the text is really important. I don't know how to call it. It's the tone of the text. The size of this uh, uh, sentences. And I try to add that when I write in Basque or translate into Basque. I think it's really important when you take a paragraph and then you have a, you, you do translate another uh, uh, paragraph with the same weight, the same extension maybe you'll leave blanks then you can go back and fill those blanks but i actually do have this feeling that there was there's this same prosody for example punctuation is really important punctuation is really important because it gives you the rhythm of what you're translating in my case in a more abstract uh, way perhaps when you talk about uh, freedom of translation, you're, you tr you're on thin ice there because it kind of suggests uh, uh, the crimes like this, uh, this story, the criminal story of translation, which you, you mentioned this book. What I support is the idea of freedom to be able to be uh, exact and accurate to the original. And this is the freedom that you lose if you come across a team of uh, people in the world of publishing who, and you say, I really want to invent a word, even though this in word doesn't exist in your vocabulary, allow me to invent it because I think it's the best way, uh, it's the best word that fits best here because I think it's it's faithful to what the author writes. And, or allow me to write a dialogue when the people who are speaking uh, don't speak properly, because that's what happens in the dialogue, and they don't let you. And for example, things like, OK, I know I've turned this sentence round, and uh, I know what's here what is there, and what's there is here. But I've done that to try to respect the author, because I'm trying to respect his style. I'm trying to observe his style. And in English, it would be the other way around. So that's the kind of freedom that I think we should claim, not the translation crimes of past years. And as for poetry translation, this is something that I find actually really upsetting because 
the poetry uh, translation of uh, Hellenic times and the translation of poetry nowadays is completely different. In the past, when a uh, poet translated another poet, what they did was they uh, based what they got from the original and wrote another poem. But now what you get is a translation in prose that tries to reproduce the significant the meaning of the poem but it's it's like a sort of a a text or like a, some notes that don't actually actually they're not actually a poem and that I don't like I've never translated poetry because I always try to translate the easiest things that are out there but at the outset I think it's really complicated. For example, it, it to just translate a s simple story. So I, I never wanted to get into major works of poetry. I know when you introduced me, it sounded like I was really important, but actually I've tried to go for easy uh, translations because when I got down to them, even they were really difficult. So I, I don't even go near, I won't touch. Uh, uh, poetry with any, but I have translated a great deal of opera, songs, but for subtitles. So there, as you said in your book, it's not translation, translation per se, it's more something that somebody's going to have to read, an audiovisual exercise, you have to take into account a whole, whole series of factors, the size of the screen, the number of words that you can read in a certain amount of time. So that's not exact translation, it's subtitling, it's so that the spectator knows why this guy is going to kill that woman, or what's happening, and why they're shouting so much up on stage. It's, it's re really that, it's like a, um, a gloss, as it were, or a gloss. So I've tried to make that as um, attractive as possible, but initially I only did it in Basque, Basque into uh, Spanish into Basque, but more recently I have to say it's been a fun experience. And some people have said that I did a good job, and that made me really happy. I wanted to also ask you about the relationship that you have with the languages that you work with, both the origin language and the uh, destination language. Javier Ancoro, you, uh, I said earlier you worked from uh, English into another language and Javier and Marian also you share your uh, target language. And we've also got uh, Romanian. Well, as I said earlier, uh, Romania, the culture of Romania isn't uh, very um, popular. They're having difficulties in getting their culture accepted. But I think literature is actually helping us understand what is happening in certain areas of former uh, countries behind countries that used to be behind the Iron Curtain. I actually approach translation from Romanian as a kind of political interpretation. If I uh, advocate uh, translating unknown literature or literature that isn't in the mainstream, for me it's a political act and it, it fits in with what I've just said, so that we can get to know better these countries. If we're going to do that, we need to have better access to the literature from those countries, quite clearly. And I really, I really, I've realised that. Catarescu's work is actually now better known in Spanish because of my translations. That opens another Pandora box with the question of how kind, what kind of Spanish do I use? What about Latin American Spanish speakers? I say that quite clearly, but of course I'm a Spanish speaker from Bilbao, and I, of course I try to avoid mm, Bilbao idioms or idioms that are classified as mistakes. But I'm also, I also realize that Catarescu in this moment is a, a, a complete phenomena 
is a popular phenomenon in South America. You get people queuing up to listen to him when he's invited to give a talk. And I, but I can't translate in a different way. I can't change the way I write in Spanish. But actually, that actually creates a little bit of concern, shall we say. I know that the word coger you can't say in Argentina. And, and, and this is something that I never thought of before, because right? you could say coger un autobús in Spanish here, but you couldn't say that in Argentina. But uh, an adv a friend said to me, well, you've got to remember that you don't only write for the Spanish public. You need to remember that. A, the Spanish uh, public, I don't want to impose a kind of Spanish that I don't speak. I don't want to impose also the Bolivian variant of Spanish or the Peru variant of Spanish because there's all kinds of dialects. It's impossible for me to do that. It would be, but nor do I want a neutral kind of Spanish that doesn't have, um, that's not fun at all. Uh, but it's a Pandora's box that I open. I think we could actually spend an hour and 50 minutes out of these two hours that we've got about why Latin American readers hate translations into Spanish carried out by Spanish speakers, by mainland Spanish speakers. How much time have we got left? 20 minutes. Oh, OK. Right. This is a subject that you talk about neutral or mid-Atlantic Spanish, if you want to call it that, the kind of, it's, but it's an artificial kind of Spanish, this neutral Spanish, Javier. When you translate into Spanish American authors, North American authors, how do you decide what kind of Spanish to use? Well, it's not my turn, because I've just spoken, but anyway. It's like what you said about our relationship with languages. There's something that I've never thought of too much. But when I hear, for example, Marianne talking about Romanian and her idea that translating from a Romanian and, ex and uh, reaching, getting Romanian culture Getting rid of Romanian culture out there is a political act. Basically, what I do for the quantity of uh, publishing houses that are flooding our country with English language literature, I think that I'm actually some kind of um, a part of something which is actually is horrible, this imperialist dominance is horrible. But you said something earlier that I thought was really interesting, which is this idea of vocation. I think I'm a character of a vocational translator because when I was a boy, when I was about 15, I was already translating at home because I didn't know many languages, just Catalan and Spanish, that I grew up with. And I had this need to get in, to find out about other things. And I thought, OK, well, everybody else speaks uh, English. So I started translating magazine articles with a typewriter. And I still use two uh, fingers to type because I've never learned how to touch type. So when I started, when I started really translating, or when I started working as a translator, I had already spent 15 years just translating things because of this madness of something that I was doing, and it was something that I thought was fun. It's a passion of mine. Yes, and I'm English, and, and, and this has been something I've been doing for my whole life. I've uh, uh, actually spent time living in the UK, in Ireland, then in the States. Then I actually married an American lady. We speak English at home. So I'm a complete victim of um, this Anglo-Saxon uh, dominance and uh, somebody that promotes it as well, as it were. In the case of Basque and the case of language standardization or Batua, uh, which started out in 1988. I think, I imagine changes, there's been changes since then. The way people work has, has changed. I could spend another hour or even two to talk about that. So I'm going to have to summarize as much as possible. 
so, something else that actually isn't that important, which is this idea of a vocational profession, the vocational translator. I didn't start. It wasn't, I wasn't, it wasn't out of vocation. I was heading for an academic career. I started out translate, I started out doing Spanish studies and then I had a, did a thesis and I thought everything that I was doing was so damn boring and same, so fake because it really, really was fake what I was doing. All these, all these PhD courses that I had to do, at least one of them, I did it in just a morning here in Bilbao. You just had to summarize a summary of a summary of a PhD thesis that somebody had written about Chomsky's. So I did this summary of a summary of a summary. And, and I actually got a, a pass mark, a pretty high, a pretty good pass mark. When uh, something a little bit more different and more interesting came out, I thought, OK, I'm going to leave you there now. So. My thesis started, I couldn't finish it, and I thought it was horrible. So the Matutene translators, translation school, which was new, that didn't have a clear legal status, was created by the Basque Language Academy, the Royal Basque Language Academy. And so I wasn't a translator, I hadn't, I, I, I just sort of, so I started out there. I thought it was far more interesting because there was no bureaucracy surrounding it or anything. And it was far more interesting than what I was doing earlier. Then it all oh, closed because there was no support for it. I ended up unemployed and I thought, well, what am I going to do now? And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll just try translating. So I've been talking about it for so long. And so I started, I was published and, you know, I've carried on till today. It's true that I've done some other things and... At home, there's always been a fixed income coming in every single month, not mine precisely. And that's really, really important, really important. Otherwise, you cannot just get involved in this world because it's just getting involved in some kind of adventure. And I haven't only done literary translation, far from it. Thank goodness I haven't had to do administrative translation. I've been able to do attractive things, but not just literature. And in our case, translating from English or Spanish into Basque or, in, or from other languages into Basque, the, the problem is always Basque. We, in my generation at least, I think that of the first, I'm the, one of the first uh, generation of modern translation, translated in the, in the fact that we take our translation from the original. That didn't happen in the past. They took it from versions, but there was virtually nothing at that time in Basque, and so we had to do what was important. So it was a kind of a emergency translation. And I think that I uh, joined the world of translation because it was an emergency. At that time, and, and nowadays it's different, there are now... Uh, translators that specialise, for example, in certain writers. That didn't happen in the, uh, in the past because there was just a huge list of different books that needed translation. So that's where I found myself back in the day. So the problem of the target language is such a minority language. And reading your... Uh, 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 book, I realized that it's not only a minority languages that aren't of interest, but also a majority languages aren't of interest either. So I'm kind, I'm kind of happy that I've read your book because I've realized that too. You have to worry about what people are going to think in Paraguay. And we, don't, we have other concerns. We saw, oh, what are they going to say in Bethkaya, you know? What are, what are the Gibbuthkwanos going to say about our Basque? But anyway, it's a language which has been standardized late in the day. In fact, its standardization hasn't finished yet. In fact, w w that's something that we're, we're missing. Although, of course, the, there are many clear dangers of very standardized languages quite clearly. Sorry, I've forgotten what I was going to say now.
Uh, yeah, yeah, I was going to talk about the problems of Basque or the problems of interpreting into Basque, or translating into Basque. In Basque, we, all of us Basque speakers, speak Spanish perfectly, and just a few of us speak perfectly French, and those also probably usually speak Spanish. So what I'm trying to say with that is that things are said, what's, there's no point in translating into Basque. We can read... Chaga in Basque, because he writes in Basque, yeah, that's fine. But what's the point of translating? We've got all the different works already translated into Spanish, why bother? So if you follow that logic, where do you end up? And what's happened? Well, today, even today, when I started for many, many years in the Basque-speaking world of completely frowned upon uh, the world of Basque translation. People would say, oh no, they've been despised, completely sidelined. Eh? For example, no, 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 no. We only work with the original. We, and on many occasions, these original texts, as Juan Garcia said, a gentleman who knows a, a lot about uh, drama. Well, well there's this uh, uh, strange phenomena which is intercranial translation. What is intercranial translation? That is an author who writes directly in Basque, or many times here, in this part of the brain, he's got Spain, Spanish. So what he's doing is translating from his brain into Basque. And that actually happens with minority languages, because you're under the weight of the other, the dominant language. That's something that's quite clearly there. And so, Many people say, no, 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 we only want the original. We don't want the translation really, really bad. It's a, kind of an identity crisis, as it were. And actually, as translation has broadened, translations have improved, and things have changed. This idea has changed completely. And now I think that it's not despised. Translation isn't despised. And proof of that is this event today. This event is quite a clear example of that. There have been several milestones over the last few years, ever since I started, and the group of what I call emergency translators began. I think then the means that we had were far poorer, both the linguistic means that we had, that is to write well, you needed a good prose and you needed excellent resources because translators can't invent everything. You can't invent prose. We work upon a prose that already exists and there wasn't a lot of that. And I've already said that I'm not a great one for challenges. Many people like it, but I'm not one of them. And that time, uh, work such as Ulysses couldn't be translated into Basque. It was impossible. It, I thought, I, mean, I think it was impossible then, because there weren't the necessary tools, instruments, linguistic and grammar and stylistic instruments out there to be able to translate this kind of uh, work, which is so complex linguistically. And, it, and well, it was published in 2015, and I think it's brilliant. It's really well done. And it really does get across Ulysses in to Basque, into the Basque language. And that's actually come about because so much has been translated and also because so many originals have been published. But now we've got these tools. There's another milestone and that's related to prestige in this case, which is the publication of Angel Lachunde's book, which it should is Angel is a, a gentleman who writes in Basque. He's one of the best writers in Basque. He's an old gentleman now. He's got a long literary tradition. He's written some excellent books. And for many, for a long time now, he's been supporting translation into Basque because well, there was a, quarter, a kind of a, a little bit of... Um, you know, looking over each other's shoulders uh, right, between writers and translators. He, but he's not like that. In 2018 or 2019, I think it was, he published a book to show 
the tremendous uh, contribution that translators have made to Basque literature, to Basque prose. And he's, this has become a really important text, a really important book, and I think it's another milestone that we need to remember. Earlier, we spoke about different forms of translation, about the possibility in the case of contemporary authors of having uh, contact with the a uh, writer with the author and the, the problems. Of course, if you're translating a classic book, the uh, author's dead. But, uh, you know, the idea of consulting if the author is still alive, uh, of consulting the author about certain things. You personally have a great relationship with him. He's a lovely uh, person. Cartarescu, and he's a great uh, gentleman. It's really easy, really, really easy to do things with him, to take part in presentations, in meetings. So personally, he's an amazing guy. A narrat at a narrative level, his work is very complex, and it, uh, it, it has... Uh, many difficulties for it, but I can't actually ask him, ask Cartarescu. I've only actually ever asked him once for a piece of advice because it was a really funny thing in a book called Nostalgia. And uh, a book, a, a child appeared called Mendebil. And when I translated that into Spanish, I uh, said to you, said to him, how would you like it translated? He said, no, 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 that's not the issue. It, it was a child in the story, and that reminded me that the uh, word mendebil, uh, that he invented in uh, Romanian, actually is related to a Basque referee called Mendibil, who in the Mexico World Championships gave a penalty against Romania and Argentina beat Romania. And so the kids started insulting each other by saying Mendebil, Mendebil out of the streets. I thought it was hilarious, just hilarious. You're trying to think about, oh, you know, what I should, what should I say? You know, what, this, is a, this is a new word that I need to invent. It sounds like weak mind, mente débil. But it was Ortiz de Mendibil. He was a referee. I mean, I don't like football, but I, even I can remember this gentleman. He had a, he had a, a moustache and he was a bit of a controversial figure. But he appeared in Cartarescu's uh, book and he, and he named a child after him. But that's the only thing I've ever asked him. I can't really ask him about narrative planes. I have to fight that, those battles on my own. No, I don't, I don't accept in specific cases you know, just anecdotal cases, but in the... When you're uh, working on the book, you, you're sort of going up and down ladders and scaffolding and trying to fit the pieces together and sweating, uh, sweating hard and when you're in that trance moment. Javier, what have you got to say about that? Everything that you wanted to say, I've already said it. There's no time left for you. I agree with you. I agree with what she says. I have nothing. I never speak to authors, ever, never. But wasn't that the question? No, that that wasn't what you were supposed to say. What was I supposed to say? You said something very interesting which I think I've got time to say in the time that's left, which is when you talk about the second uh, wage being brought home. Um, and that is the great secret of translation, which is to marry somebody really, really um, wealthy. Or a civil servant, or a civil servant. They're not wealthy, but, that, but you know, they've got a stable wage coming home. For me, fortunately, All of the people that I've translated had already been dead, so I couldn't ask them anything anyway. But anyway. I've only ever translated 
one live author, Asun Garicano, who I translated from Basque into Spanish. There, actually, we did work a little bit together. Well, a little bit together, I mean, working together. And she revised what I'd translated. Because, of course, she spoke uh, both languages like I do, and she's a translator. So if it's uh, a writer that hasn't, hasn't a clue about Basque, then what are you going to be able to ask them? Maybe the odd question, but not very much. I like to be on my own in front of my computer. Because there are four, five, or six different options for each sentence. So I like to choose mine. Because I'm going to be signing the translation. If it's wrong, then that's my fault as well. What I also like, and I think this is also something we should complain, or, or is the corrector, a good publishing corrector. You talk about castrating correctors, but a good corrector who really has a command of the language, who really uh, realizes what you could come up against, a proofreader. OK, time is upon us. We've got 10 minutes for questions from the audience. Does anybody want to ask anything? Somebody's raised their hand, and there are some mics out in the room. So please do wait for a mic to come to you. Thanks so much for this talk about translation. It's fascinating, this world of translation that is uh, hidden and tucked away and bringing it uh, to the fore in Gutun Surya. So thank you for doing that. And I've got two questions, or just maybe two thoughts, which if you find a bit odd, just tell me. I think that when you translate a language, you have uh, images, you have silences, and you have uh, uncomprehended uh, words. With these images and these silences that each language has with it, how do you how do you deal with that? That's one question. And are you ever t tempted to write? Because I think if you read a lot of people, uh, you end up uh, actually uh, wanting to write or rewrite. That's my question. Thank you. Does anybody want to respond? As for the first part of the question, if I understood you correctly, it's a question about the limits of translation. I think that and I'm not trying to make out our translation is great, but I think we find things that are untranslatable every single day of our lives. Every single day we're sort of banging our heads against these, uh, this wall that exists between two languages sometimes where, you, you, where there's this area you think you can't translate. And you, tr you try to get round this problem with little tricks, and that's what I really, really like, this fact that you're doing something which is actually quite violent all the time, which is to pretend that you've actually written the same thing that they've written in the book, in the original, but it's not the same. So you've got a whole series of tricks and strategies uh, out there, but yes, the limits to translation are out there all the time, and this daily the struggle is uh, fascinating. At least I find it fascinating. It's one of my passions. And second, the second part of your question, I don't know if you were referring to the attempt to write the original when you translate or say, oh, bugger this, I'm going to write my own book. Well, if it's the second question, yes, I've already done that. I've succumbed to the temptation to write. I'm a writer. And over time, I've actually started thinking, I don't know if it's true or not, that... It's better. It's better for translators to actually write. It's better for a translator. A translator learns by translating. They also learn by writing. So I shall now hand the floor back to my colleagues. As for the first question, I actually fully agree with what Javier said. And the second question, 
I've never felt tempted to become a writer ever. I understand what Javier says about the fact that they feed off each other, translation and writing, but I don't write. I, I write mentally, but I'm not actually tempted to sit down and uh, write formally, no. Yeah, it's there, that's all I can say. I actually can't think of anything to say, to be honest, or anything to write about. Uh, I, I was part enough translating what others have written. And this issue of violence, the, you said, and on many occasions I've been tempted to actually write the opposite of what's written. I've never done that, but I've, I've, I actually felt like it. Just to see if anybody realizes, I've never done that. I, I couldn't, I didn't dare. It was shame, really. I have improved the original once, yes, I have to say, once. There's an interview with us two in El Correo newspaper today. And the interview's great if you read it in the newspaper. But the journalist asked me to say whether I've actually had to invent any words or a, or a new a sentence or curious anecdotes. And I said, oh, yeah, I invent every day all the time to a certain extent. That's true. Like you said, And then I realized something actually that happened. And I was trying to find it and I wrote it down. Uh, and I wrote it down very carefully. And what it is, this is a, a very well um, explained summary. And this text I entitled Syntactical Satisfaction. What it is, it's an Edgar Allan Poe, a story. It's terrible. He's got several terrible, several terrible stories, but this is the most terrible for me. And there, the uh, protagonist or the main character at the end of the story in the final paragraph. Sorry, he's uh, in love with his cousin. She uh, falls ill. She actually gradually disappears. Uh, her beauty disappears except for her teeth. And he's obsessed with her and her teeth, which is the only beautiful thing that's left of her. So in the final paragraph, it turns out that she's dead. And somebody's actually... desecrated her tomb and he's actually got his uh, clothes covered in blood and mud and he picks up a box and 32 uh, small um, white things fall out of the box and some surgical instruments and in fact this story gets more and more tense until the final final paragraph the final sentence when you discover that he pulled her teeth out probably when she was still alive. So, the thing is, in English there's a, a, a certain kind of structure, i.e. subject, verb, object, but in Basque it's a completely different subject, a different structure, sometimes that we complain about that a lot, which is which is different, doesn't matter, I won't explain, this is different. So I'm just writing along in Basque and I realize that in Basque, the teeth, the word teeth comes right at the end of everything, not just at the end of the paragraph, but at the end of everything, 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 the, the teeth that are ind indirectly uh, mentioned. This was 30 something years ago and I was just sitting in front of my computer on my own and I didn't mention it to anybody, but now I remembered this tremendous satisfaction and such pride. Oh God, you know, if Poe could have seen this, he would have been envious of me because I didn't, I didn't reveal the teeth thing till right at the end. So I improved the original because you didn't know about the teeth until right at the end. So once again, I overcame the impossible in Basque. So there you go. There is an advantage to minority languages. 
Uh, is there time for any more questions? One more? As there are three of you here, I wanted to ask about a doubt that I had when I was reading recently, which is, well, I've been listening to you and I was trying to remember the article that I'd read. When Biden took power, Amanda Morgan read a poem. She's a young poet, poet, a feminist poet, who speaks about, he speaks about the African diaspora. And it was something that was very, very moving in the Basque country. And it was translated in Europe. And it spoke about the different approaches that have been made to this translation. I don't know in which country in Northern Europe, and I can't remember because I'm talking from memory. It, w it was said that three women had translated it. And in Spain, it had been translated by a man, a heterosexual man. So there, people were reflecting about this approach, this approach to translation. And as you're translating and you've spoken about what's formal, I just wondered if you think it's just some kind of a contemporary imposture or whether these interpretations well, anyway, what, I wanted to know what you think about that. I mean, do you think it was a complete stupidity? Do you think it's an interesting approach? When I read the article, I thought it was really interesting, but actually don't know what to say in response. I think I'd have died of starvation. Uh, that's the thing. If this, if this rule had been implied, I, I'd have... unless I'd have been married, I hadn't been married to a civil servant who had brought wages home. And you, the same would have happened to you. I actually, actually don't know what they're driving at. Well, the fact that the poem was translated by a man when the author was a woman, an Afro-American woman. Yeah, I think I'd heard about this. It couldn't be any old woman either. Afro so if you take that to all the extremes, then maybe she should have translated it herself. If you take it to the ultimate extreme, if you, you know, pull that thread, the ultimate conclusion, that opens another Pandora's box, but which we really can't broach this evening. I think that this reaction by Amanda Borman is a response to the identity crisis that American society is going uh, through at the moment. And it's this way that they understand the rest of the world like only uh, noble men of the 18th century can be translated by 18th century noblemen. That just is creating mad, uh, empty silos. I've indirectly taken part in a fun activity which a series of translators have started in Europe, which is to uh, create a poem to reply to Amanda Borman in rap. I didn't give the reply, a Romanian uh, prepared the reply. It's a way of understanding this. I think it's just cultural, a politically a politically motivated decision, and I don't agree with it. I don't think a woman has to translate a woman, nor do I think a colored person has to translate a colored person, nor do I think homosexuals should be translating homosexuals. I don't think literature's, that's not what literature's about. At least that's my personal opinion. I think the same. Okay, time's up. So thanks to all of you for having come. Thanks also to Javier, Marian, and Coro. And see you again for the next event of Gutun Surya. Thank you. <laughs>